Good to have you all back to another episode, actually the 218th of ThinkTech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. We're broadcasting live again from three different locations in the world, from Long Beach, California with Ron Lindgren. Hi, Ron. Hello. And back in Honolulu, Hawaii with DeSoto Brown. I, Hello, so, everybody. Hello, everybody. So, so we're back as the three from the filling station in our series about whenever we get stuck in sort of the mud of mediocrity in architecture, which unfortunately in Hawaii, very sadly, recently happens a lot. We try to get the wheels free and spinning again by looking outside of architecture and the realm of automobiles into architecture and get sort of a fresh angle. So um, let's dive right back in and bring up the first slide. And we've been just because of very specific circumstances that we'll really touch on uh, here and there later on. Uh, it's about movies and you are, you know, Ron, you're watching what uh, you assigned yourself um, one movie at least per day, right? So you're one of the biggest movie nuts. Yes. <laughs> Right, and this Indeed. is one. This is one I watched uh, on the way uh, back to Hawaii, and uh, this is called Ford versus Ferrari. And last time we were talking about the exotic, right? And Yuta Soto had shared these advertisements for Kalakaua Motors, who were, you know, marketing this sort of uh, more, you know, decently sized German Ford version. Uh, the Ford Taunus, and then they were trying to bring the sexiness of Italian scooters, the Vespas, with incredible, I think they said 100 miles per gallon gas mileage. Right, right. right. So this right. movie is really greatly depicting that. This is a, a, is a watching recommendation here about these two worlds. And there is the, the young uh, Lee Ayakaka there. We were just talking about, well, let's not get into it now, but we will talk about it later about how do you portray history. Here, it's actors playing real people in history. This is Lee Ayakaka, the young Lee Ayakaka, who was basically going up in front of the CEOs of the sort of encrusted, and, and the Mr. Ford, I think the second it was, you know, is greatly depicted there, this sort of grumpy guy. And he's trying to make the case, which you just sort of been pointing out that, you know, the screenshot I did in the in the airplane at the top left is like when he said, well, you know, we try to get provide Americans with everything that the American dream has to provide a house right on their own and a car. But the cars were pretty much like we were talking about in the last show. Right. They were like the ostentatious and extravagant Finn American Straßenkreuzers. And at some point, you know, um, they couldn't satisfy the young and upcoming hungry generation because something was missing. And he was then portraying that at the bottom right with Sophia Loren. You know, the sexiness. He said, people want to see, besides safety and security, they want sexiness. And that's what truly the American automakers present and demonstrate, and that's what Ferrari is about, right? And he tried to basically then talk them into basically uh, doing, um, you know, doing that. And um, uh, yeah, so then the rest is you watch the movie, right? But it's along the same line. So it's a great movie to kind of watch. And we want to, you know, this is about architecture too. So, I mean, they really portray like the, mid-century modern international style sort of you know office building that you see up there which obviously ron in your area you know the image number three at the top right michael if you could go there um you know uh, less than ever this is appropriate right because you had the heat right now you have that crazy cyclone there the bomb cyclone so you know they have the wildfires so the architecture of international style, you know, was was already problematic to begin with, but is increasingly being sort of inappropriate for the climate of your home and equally the climate of your home, uh, the solo, right? So let's go to the next slide. 
And this is your stage now because we're talking cars as um, status symbols and as expression of extravaganza, Ron, right? And that gets you going. Yeah, the, the uh, picture at the upper left just happens to be one of uh, Craig Elwood's uh, very famous houses. Uh, he, was, he was such a great self-promoter of, of his, his office, of his particular style of Southern California mid-century modernism. And uh, for him, an automobile uh, really was a status symbol. That was probably the most important thing. That's not to say that he probably didn't enjoy driving the cars that he did, but he expressed his self-image of being successful and, and talented and in, in all sorts of ways. But one way was to always be seen driving a the most luxurious, the newest, uh, the most sought after car you can imagine. And in this particular uh, picture, that's not necessarily his car, but uh, Martin, you're, you're seeing that as one of the very famous Jaguar models. Yeah, that's the E-Type they positioned in front of this house. And again, this is the show quote if you want to know more about it. And you perfectly portrayed him in the show that we called Cultivated Classics. And then his name wasn't even Craig Elwood. His name was Burke. What was his first name again? Help me out. I think Johnny John Burke. Yeah, Johnny Burke. Exactly. And the, the pick on the right that we, as an exception to the rule, pulled from the web here, is uh, showing one of his buildings and this Lamborghini Espada from the late 60s to 70s, which is this really extravagant car that, again, is in compliance with his very extravagant architecture. Not to say that they weren't both uh, what we're interested in, also, um, you know, very performative. I mean, these were fast cars. And his buildings were very performative, especially in the days of, you know, uh, climate change. You see these sort of grills there. Uh, we did a show to Soto of gentle grills and gones. So there's certainly um, an aspect um, of environmental performance there. So it's not just showing off on the surface, right? There is some substantial and the, the Hawaii equivalent of that one, Ron, is um, you guys having been the heroes and the legends of hospitality design. And who was your companion, or one could also say another CU competitor in that field? Which Hawaii architect or architect operating from Hawaii was that who we see at the very bottom right in this building? Uh, it was, but it was, we see it always, Wimberley. It was always the firm uh, of Wimberley. Uh, who were also uh, beginning to build around the world at about the same time we were. And so a very large firm uh, versus our medium to small firm, it was always an interesting uh, competition between us. Yeah. And we, at the bottom right, the show quote, um, I have this from a Docomomo talk story that uh, Pete Wimberley's late partner, Don Gu, was giving, as you had given one, Ron, for us about uh, your office's work. And you see him here basically together with Steve McQueen and basically racing in Le Mans. And he was racing this uh, yellow lotus there. So again, they probably, again, for the reason depicted in the movie we showed on the first slide, Ford versus Ferrari, uh, they've, they weren't uh, driving even, you know, what the alternative was in the, mo in the movie is basically the, um, you know, the Cobra, right? The Cobra car was the answer that Ford and basically had to compete with Ferrari and being equally sexy. But, you know, these guys, uh, both Craig Elwood and um, Pete Wimberley, weren't falling for that. They wanted the exotic, and the uh, exotic was Italian, the exotic was Lamborghini and Lotus. And we see um, at the bottom left uh, one of Pete's uh, legacy buildings, and which one is that? And I'll explain a little bit more about the, the, the sort of the historic connotation and even the contemporary de Soto. Well, this is the Bank of Hawaii building located on Kalakaua Avenue in Waikiki and was built in 1965-66. And it's basically just a rectangular high-rise office building, but it's got this 
very sort of interesting scallop swooping exterior structure around it that encases it that makes it really dramatic looking and at the time there was a lot of speculation as to what those forms were supposed to suggest or be inspired by and the thing that most people said was it's supposed to look like the top of a pineapple because of course the pineapple industry was very important in hawaii at that time uh wimberly said no it isn't supposed to look like anything it's just uh, something to look exotic and interesting in a resort area. Now, mind you, this is Waikiki in the 60s when it was growing very dramatically because of the increase of tourists, because of the jet age, because of jet airplanes coming here. So this is kind of a nod to Waikiki as an exotic destination and turning an office building, which was otherwise very prosaic, into something artistic and interesting and eye-catching which a lot of tourists took note of as part of their Waikiki vacation of the time. And they still do. Our exotic escapism expert, Zana, identifies that as still her favorite building in the hood yeah. of Waikiki. <laughs> and a lot of stuff has come after. And it is this generic pastiche cheesecake factory stuff that's replaceable. And you find it with this look anywhere in the world. While this one here is really distinct. And again, like you were pointing out the Soto, you know, it isn't looking, it depends on what you want to see it represents. And of course, the structural engineer would see arches in it, right? The, uh, the pigeon would see that it's poop. It's basically not sitting on any horizontal parts. And there's its sibling is, um, is Vladimir Osipov's IBM building where both had decided, okay, we are not doing the international style glass box that we saw depicted in, on the first slide in the, in the screenshots of the, of the movie, but they were recognizing we're in the tropics, so we're giving it a screen. Now the question is to contemporary standards of absolutely high energy efficiency. If you would ecotech them, which is a software that the youngest generation is supposed to use, you can say, you can debate of how much percentage it is going to shade over the time of the day. But at least there's the gesture of that, right? And you could actually retrofit it and could use the arches as to mount exterior, you know, movable screen shading at the back of it. So it would, it would hold that. And so there is a potential there. And uh, the, you could also and probably should bring back the plinth that we see was designed in a similar way. It isn't like that anymore. It's the same generic, you know, storefront that we have, unfortunately, all over Kalakaua Avenue. So um, true. Dive more into the tropical exotic and the metal always being shinier and gaudier on the other side gets us to the next slide is uh, I think I've seen one, to be honest. Uh, I was really surprised, but I didn't find the picture. But uh, DeSoto, have you ever seen on the island more than that one, or have you even seen that one, that car that we see at the bottom left, the Opel GT? Um, I don't remember how many, if any, actually got here. Um, this, is, this is one of the things that's interesting is how how it's cho how certain cars are chosen to be imported into the United States. And there are a lot of uh, ramifications as to how that happens, safety equipment, et cetera, as to also, do they think it'll actually sell? So yeah. those are things that are unknown to most of us as to whether we see them or not. Exactly. And this is one of the most traditional car brands in Germany that don't belong to the, the ones that you consider to be the fancy ones that, for that reason, never really made it that much into the US. So they stay very tropical. Sorry, they stay very exotic and not tropical. And this is Opel. So Adam Opel was just, you know, really early. And as we see on the picture, number one, in having one of the co-proprietors next to Ford to having developed the automobile. And then next to that number two is a piece uh, provided by uh, our semi who was uh, shooting that when his mother was driving on the Autobahn. This is a, you know, an old Opel from the 40s or the 50s that was somewhere in storage. It 
you know, pick this mold up there and or, or algae sort of in this green. And so here are them. And the, the one, the Opel GT down there was an answer to the Corvette. So it's like the German poor man's Corvette. It was smaller, but it has the same kind of features and the pop-up headlights. And obviously this is an original advertisement that wants to promote it obviously as very sexy, right? And Opel is, is basically still around, but Opel struggled. And Opel happens to be the main plant, um, actually used to be in the city of Bochum, where we have designed the canopy for the subway. And when we won this competition, soon after that, basically GM, who bought Opel, by the way, uh, struggled, as we know. And so Opel struggled, so Bochum struggled. So Martin's firm and his father's firm struggled. And it actually took 10 years uh, to get the project basically built. And Opel is still around. You see at the bottom right, some of their kind of new ideas for new cars, kind of fancy, kind of kooky that you could like pull a Segway out of the, the rear part of it. So they're still trying to be living up to their original sort of you know pioneering history but um, there is a connection to Hawaii through your family and that we see on picture seven and tell us more about it and actually six as well six and seven well the uh, as we have discussed in the past in the late 1950s when American cars became immensely big and immensely gaudy and immensely strange looking a number of uh, American consumers turned to purchasing foreign cars and General, uh, General Motors, as you said, was the owner of Opel. So for a brief period, they imported Opels to the United States and sold them. And the pictures that you see are one, an Opel arriving in a ship here in Honolulu in 1957, which unfortunately had been badly damaged en route and was being unloaded just to go to the junkyard. But also in 1958, my grandmother bought an Opel Caravan station wagon. And that is the certificate of ownership that my grandmother had here in Honolulu for her Opel that she owned for a few years. So she fell for the allure of the exotic, small, uh, compact car, just as many other people did at that time. Yeah. And uh, go to the next slide. And uh, Ron, I want to address you as, for me, amazingly, for Half of a century, the Killingsworth office has basically been staying true to itself and was sort of resilient to the quasi, you know, um, expectations of changing zeitgeist all the way through from modernism to postmodernism, which we always say we believe we're still in. It just dresses differently. And you guys were in a refreshingly and uh, amazing stubborn way resisting that automotive industry because, because of the way it is set up, having to cater to people in a way more direct way are not able to do that. And so from this kind of context, I would like to pick your brain, Ron, on the AMC Pacer that we see in there. What are your memories and your thoughts about what happened? in the sort of in, in the moment of time when the AMC Pacer came out? I'm, I'm a, a, a bit uh, at a loss on this. Uh, I, I, I think that I've only saw, seen maybe two or three Pacers in my life. And uh, uh, I, uh, I, I was gonna say in, in response to your, what you were saying about our office, uh, you know, we, we sat there and worked and were just amazed that things like deconstructionism and postmodernism and whateverism were flashing by like a flash in the pan. And we just kept our heads down and kept busy. Uh, the Pacer looks like a pretty serious car, though. You'll have to tell me about it. Well, and again, the, the metal is always different on the other side. Um, yeah, I mean, it is, we had 73, 73 is this really serious year that you guys remember as we do here, because it was the first oil crisis in history that was resource uh, rooted, but basically politics, right? And uh, it made, you know, people and architects, but you guys had been pretty much biochromatic 
to begin with. So you didn't really have to change much. You just continued to do buildings that were in balance with the natural environment and used natural ventilation and things. So there was actually no need for you to change. But as we pointed out in the last shows, particularly in the last one, America had to because they had these big Straßenkreuzer, the big gas guzzlers, and there was no way for them to survive. They were like dinosaurs that got extinct abruptly through like the real dinosaurs got by volcanoes erupting, you know, and ice age and stuff like that. For the Straßenkreuzer dinosaurs, it was the oil crisis. So the AMC PESA was, from my German point of view, and you, the solo, now jump in and help, was that desperate attempt of the American car industry to say, now we're going to do what these other Europeans have been doing for a while and actually do smaller cars. Is that fair to say? Yeah, and, and th that had already happened once before. As I mentioned just earlier, the uh, American car companies had to respond in 1959 to and 1960 to the sudden popularity of imported cars. And then those compact cars that they invented suddenly began to grow again. And then in the early 1970s, they had to do it all over again, and they invented the, uh, the Ford Pinto and the Chevrolet Vega. And American Motors at that time was a much smaller and ultimately failing car company. And they had the advantage of being small, so they were able to design more quirky and unusual vehicles for a niche market. And the Pacer was one of those vehicles. It's like a bubble. It's like a big rounded thing with a lot of glass. And it was a compact car to a degree, but it was actually still quite large inside. And it was always a peculiar and funny looking and interesting car. So they were trying to appeal not to everybody, but to a smaller percentage of the population. And I also might just say too, since this is about architecture, the Pacer is very architectural in the same way as uh, like the international style structures were with not as much of a framework or not as much metal, but a lot of glass. And mm -hmm. in a hot climate, that, of course, would make you more hot, which you don't necessarily want. But it is eye-catching, and it did yeah. appeal to a certain group of people. Yeah. And the, the makers of the Pixar movies uh, used uh, the AMC Pesa, as we see it here uh, in the middle on the right, as one of the bad guys. And the, the ones they, they selected were the cars that basically flopped, that didn't really make it. And, uh, but that is all, you know, for the same reason, it was sort of cute. And number five, uh, there's this hilarious story of, again, that we Europeans might look at this way more nostalgic than you Americans do. Um, all the Europeans I have been in touch had been one way or another really, really emotional about it. Uh, one of my colleagues from Hanover, you know, was getting into a fight with me because he hated them. And when I was looking at one that we were driving by, he kind of yelled at me. And I also have an, an American colleague who uh, expressed the same feelings about it. And then it was ironic that we had this fellow European, a lady on number five, Winka Doubledam. She's a Dutch architect who practices in New York. And we had invited her for a lecture in my prairie days, at the University of Nebraska. And I was sitting next to my American colleague. It was right after that dispute we had about the pacer. And she started her lecture and sharing what? This is my beloved AMC Pacer, and I just kicked him <laughs> in the side and got a kick out of it, right? So it's really interesting how people, architects, can get really, really emotional about cars, right? And that shows how much more personal. With architecture, not so much, right? Architecture seems to be more detached uh, and more for kind of the, the, the disciplinary circles to basically get really you know, all over it and, and debate and argue, but not so much the general public. So we want to use the little remaining time to actually introduce another a character from the Cars movies that is very little known. And this is now in exchange, while the Pacer that comes from you guys, you actually don't have so much to say about it. Now we turn this around, next slide, because there's a car from my culture 
that you actually know way more about and you taught me about a soda. So go ahead. <laughs> Jump in. This is a this is a very short-lived German car from 1957 to 58, and it's called the Janus in American pronunciation. And it was made by a company that actually just manufactured uh, motorcycles in Germany, and then they branched out into making a mini car. This was really notable because the front and the back of the car were identical. And they both had a door that opened up at an angle. And inside, the engine was in the center of the vehicle, and the two seats were back to back. So the people in the front faced the front, and the people in the back faced the back. And if you wanted to, you could open up the back entire back of the car while the car was driving, which was demonstrated in a little advertising film that the uh, Germans, the company made at the time that the car was for sale. Now, supposedly only something like 20 or 25 of these Janus cars were imported into the United States, I have read. And if that's true, a number of them ended up right here in Honolulu because there was actually a Janus dealer on Kapiolani Boulevard that was part of a, a larger, another uh, imported car dealer. And there's a picture of the Janus car in front of that dealership on Kapiolani Boulevard. Now this was not a long lived car, as, as I just said. Um, it ended up being too weird and too quirky and too little for even people in Germany and the rest of Europe to buy. But there is a hardcore group of collectors today who still treasure these cars. And you can look at videos on YouTube of them getting all together and driving around in caravans of these funny little Janus cars. And Janus, by the way, was a Roman god who had two faces. So they faced in different directions, opposite directions. Thus, the Janus car mimics the Janus god from Roman uh, culture. Yeah. But for the Pixar guys, and if we can get number five up and large here, uh, that guy, the, the company, the, the brand was called Zündup. And that's even hard. I always have the weekly German lesson for you. So that's spelling wise kind of tough, right? You got the Z and then the U with the umlauts, with the dots. And so, uh, so, so Zündup basically in the Pixar, in the Cars movie, uh, was taking the lead because Dr. Zundup was the main bad guy. He was the leader bad guy of all the other sort of silly, unfortunate kind of crew members as the AMC Pacers and the Pintos and the other one. So that's kind of a really interesting thing. And once again, we learn from each other from the different parts of the world. Thanks for teaching me part of my automotive history that I did not know Hadn't we talked and hadn't you pointed out? Because I never heard of any Janos dealership here anywhere uh, in my hometown. So thanks for that. Okay, I think we're at the end of the show. So look forward to, we might venture out and go back to uh, the core of architecture with actually the three of us. Uh, there's a couple of events that happened to us uh, personally and professionally that we thought are worth uh, sharing. Uh, and the, so this show will, sequence will be called Everything Happens for Reasons, which we're probably going to start out with next week. But then again, we always will take a break from that and go back to the automotive. And we'll continue with uh, something that's very familiar to you, Ron, and for us, because this is about our favorite Audis that we drive. And especially the ones that um, you know are a couple of years old. So I'm going to introduce uh, one that you guys, uh, at least officially, had never seen because it was never exported to the U.S. And you guys will wonder why. So until then, thanks, guys, and everyone else, and see you next week. And until then, stay increasingly mentally mobile as we. <laughs> bye bye.